Good afternoon. Now, it was just nine months ago at WEF in Davos that there was consensus that the global economy was firing on all cylinders and that global growth was on a solid momentum, especially for Asia. Today, nine months on, look at where we are, on the verge of a full-blown trade war. The US has said it wants to impose tariffs on almost all Chinese imports, China has said it will retaliate. We also have an emerging market route. And that's because of the tightening we're seeing in the US. We have a strong dollar. The strong dollar was expected, but the pace of increase has become a bit mind-boggling. Now, add to that, we have the fourth industrial revolution and if that is not enough, a demographic shift. So everything and the kitchen sink. Given such a scenario, what are the prospects for growth for Asia? Given that most people say fundamentals are intact, where do we go from here? What are the challenges ahead? What do policymakers and companies have to do to ensure that the region maintains its growth? We have a very distinguished panel of speakers today. Please do welcome Bank of Thailand Governor Viratai Sandip Prabhup to my left. Ibu Srimulyani Indrawati, Indonesia Finance Minister. Louder, please. Nazar Razak, CIMB Group Chairman. Judy Shu, Stanchard Regional CEO for ASEAN and South Asia. And Kevin Sneeder, McKinsey Global Managing Partner. Thank you so much for being here today. Now, Nazar, we'll start with you. Since you're sitting in the middle, you'll start the ball rolling. Larry Summers says that the current period of prosperity that we're seeing right now is more fragile than many of us suppose. Do you agree with that? Is that a reflection of how Asia is today? Well, I, I'm not sure of the context uh, he said that, but I take it at face value. Um, if you look at it today, Asia, um, there are some potential flashpoints uh, geopolitically. You talk about North Korea, you talk about South China Sea. But if you look at it in relative terms, um, look at where ASEAN was uh, at the beginning and where ASEAN is today. We've gone from a zone of tension and conflict to one of peace and stability that has allowed tremendous economic growth over um, uh, many, many years. Uh, and therefore, when you look at it relatively, uh, I, think, I think not in Asia. But if you look uh, at the broader global scene, I'm a little bit more anxious. If you look at this uh, uh, rise of China and how uh, the US is now responding, uh, it worries me. Because I think we've lived with this US-led rules-based system. Uh, and one of our big assumptions has been that the US leadership have been globalists. Right? Now we have a leadership that is very nationalist. Uh, and its attitude uh, to the rise of China and the rest of the world uh, worries me. And I think you know, uh, President Jokowi, uh, although he denied it, <laughs> said it very clearly this morning uh, in terms of attitude uh, being very, one should be positive about uh, the economy being potentially a win-win, uh, that resources in this world are infinite, not finite. Uh, and we should not be, we should look at this rise of China and a multipolar world uh, as something to adjust to uh, rather than something to resist. Judy, you're pretty upbeat. Yeah, I am pretty upbeat. Um, Clearly, the recent emerging market um, sort of weakness that spilled over from um, the, a couple of other countries like Argentina and uh, Turkey is something we're quite, uh, you know, uh, cautious about, right? We have to continue to monitor what does that mean from, uh, from a short-term perspective. But if, if, you know, talking to many of our clients uh, who have been operating in this region, 
Uh, this is not the first time they're, de they're dealing with these volatilities. Uh, this pattern has happened time and time again. And what's, what's I think different is that many of our clients have become quite well versed with managing this risk. They have access to really good hedging tools. And if I look at you know, what I've seen since early this year, um, a lot of the importers are you know, increasing their hedging ratio. A lot of clients with dollar loans have you know, aggressively locked in their interest rates. So people are managing this volatility much better. And if I look at, you know, in the long run, of course, you know, the U.S.-China trade tension, how it will play out, this protectionist sentiment is something I think it's going to be a new norm. Uh, but just look at the underlying fundamentals in Asia, you know, or in ASEAN, 650 million people, 50% uh, of them between the age of 20 to 45, really dynamic working, uh, 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 and dynamic, uh, you know, working population, uh, internet uh, penetration in Vietnam is 80%. Uh, it's just really strong fundamental. So as a bank, we remain very confident and very committed to this region. Uh, we believe in the fundamentals. We have to manage the short-term volatilities, but uh, yeah, we're still positive. But Ibu Shimuliani, there is a disconnect when it comes to the economy and the markets, the reaction from the market so far, I mean, in terms, in terms of the emerging market route, it's been quite startling, especially for Indonesia. Well, um, there is a perception which is affecting the way the market behaves. And in a globalized world, especially when everybody, the analysts will say the emerging market, as if emerging market is like all homogeneous uh, economy, I think that is the consequence that we cannot uh, uh, avoid. But the, it is even within this kind of context of dynamic or psychology, uh, we can actually still can convey and explain clearly each country's strength or maybe some limitation or weaknesses and how the policymaker respond to that. I think uh, restoring the rationality uh, of the market is going to be very important. Because again and again, in many of the financial crises in the past, uh, the psychology, or in this case, uh, the contagion, is going to create damage which is beyond the fundamental or beyond what is uh, acceptable from the fundamental point of view. So, policymakers within this kind of context first have to focus in explaining where our economy position at this moment. Credibility matters, and track record is uh, certainly very, very important. You cannot, in the past three years or five years, doing something else, and then now you suddenly say differently. And that's why it's very important for you. But if you want to change the course of your policy, because you recognize what happened in the past is not suitable or not compatible with the fundamental that you try to build, that's good. That means you are going to the right direction. But if you try to deny what is actually the problem in your economy, I think that's going to create another credibility. And that can uh, creating, feeding into another psychology cycle. So for Indonesia, I think today, if you look at the past four years, everybody mentioned about oh, Indonesia, maybe it's going to be one of the country that is being seen a little bit more vulnerable externally because of current account deficit. Then people try to compare with 2013 when we have taper tantrum, or even I'm amazed that someone can have a long memory back to 1997. <laughs> I mean, and then you try to, it, now everybody try to compare that statistically, and you look what is the difference between then and now, and what is the policy response. Indonesia has actually repeatedly and learning as mentioned earlier, learning lesson from what is uh, actually happened uh, since 97-98. Banking sector has been regulated more uh, 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 credibly. Uh, monetary policy independent and sound. They are focusing on stability on a rupiah in terms of inflation, exchange rate. They have policy mix. Government in this case is doing all the necessary from the fiscal side, sound macro policy and structural policy in order to address the issue uh, fundamental for Indonesia. Not everything can have an immediate impact, but the track record is there. 
So today Indonesia in this case is actually is much stronger and we try to convey this kind of message to all the market players including the fund manager in order for them to make the right decision which is not only uh, if they make the decision wrong, not only bad for them, but also for the economy in general. Now we talk about addressing vulnerabilities. Thailand has been there before, but this time round, it's escaping it pretty unscathed. In terms of policies, what do you think has gone right for Thailand? Well, um, Thailand has built quite a number of buffers during the past you know, four or five years. Um, you know, we realize that if you look back since the global financial crisis, um, you know, the world experienced with excessive liquidity and this artificial liquidity, and one day normalizations would come. So when we developed policies, we had a long-term view, you know, trying to look through the, 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 the cycle uh, in anticipation of a situation like what is happening now. Uh, we have built up international reserves. We have reduced dependence on short-term external finance. The government has also conducted a lot, of, a lot of debt restructuring, refinancing foreign debts well ahead of Chair 2. Um, the private sector has also been uh, very mindful of um, potential currency mismatches. You know, we still have a very good memory from the 1997 Asian financial crisis. And we have also uh, been, been quite um, forceful in terms of bank regulations, making sure that they have ample uh, liquidity and also ample capital adequacy. So I think in times of like this, it depends on, 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 on the buffers that each emerging market country has. Um, you know, given the size of international reserve, low dependence of um, external financing, and it also helps that we have large current account surplus. Um, this year, we should expect about 8 to 9% of GDP surplus, and, and that, that's, that's a big buffer. Uh, Kevin, Asia, ASEAN in a better position to navigate well, there's lots to navigate, but I think at the end of the day, we should remember the resilience of this part of the world. This is a part of the world that's been through many ups and downs. It knows how to manage volatility. Some will do it better than others, but just some facts on this point. We looked at 71 emerging, mar emerging markets over the last 50 years. We looked to see which ones had outperformed the US over that period of time. 18 had outperformed the US, eight of them are in ASEAN. And I think when you think about that number, you start to get a sense an awful lot has happened over those 50 years, the ups and downs. So the navigation here, I think, is around volatility, but the eye on the prize is the long-term development of a region that still has some very strong fundamentals in its favor, not least continued urbanization, continued development of the consuming classes, and that creates a very nice flywheel. The challenges, infrastructure still needs to improve. ASEAN is under-investing in infrastructure. Its education system needs to cope with a very different makeup of the jobs that we're going to see in the future. And also we have the challenge of not enough women in the workplace. So there's a lot of things which ASEAN still has to navigate, but let's not lose sight of the long-term trend. And the volatility in Argentina and other places that has leaked into this part of the world, let's keep that in perspective. You haven't got economies here that doubled the amount of their dollar loans in the space of a very short amount of time. So I think we have a fundamentally different set of economic characteristics in this part of the world, and we have to disaggregate this before we generalize about contagion reaching us. But, but despite all the optimism, the markets can stay irrational for much longer than we can stay solvent. I mean, what message, what needs to be done? I mean, could it be a case of uh, central banks and finance ministries having to work together and send a consistent message? No, definitely, and you know, I very much um, like the idea that the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of and the Central Bank work together to deal with issues about current account deficit. I think it's, it's an excellent uh, example that policymakers in other countries should also look at. Um, the market has become very sensitive. In the world, when we had excess liquidity, everyone was searching for you. And we look at financial instrument uh, products out there, we have a lot of yield enhancement mechanisms, using of derivatives and the like. So when there's any changes in market expectation, they tend to be ultra sensitive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, coordination of policies, coordination of communication messages <laughs> between different authorities is, is a prerequisite to ensure that we can go through this cycle smoothly. But if the source of the psychology in this case is coming from the normalization of the monetary policy in the United States, mm -hmm. especially with the increasing interest rate, maybe tighter bit uh, liquidity. And then also a, another source of uh, uh, concern is the trade policy, uh, trade war. 
then we have to accept that this is going to be still continue. The different maybe each country in responding to this kind of global environment, how you react, how you respond, and how you are going to continue maintaining the progress and momentum, while at the same time be very mindful that the risk is increasing. I think in terms of the normalization of the interest rate or increasing interest rate in the, in the Federal Reserve, globally the interest rate is going to be increased. What does this signal need to be responded by the policymaker? For us, for example, our deficit need, need to be reduced. Why? If you are going to run deficit, you make sure that this additional debt is going to have a productivity better than the interest rate that you have to pay. And this is more a signaling that you have to be more prudent in spending, designing your budget, as well as in the current account deficit, you have to make sure your saving is increased, your investment maybe need to be selective on what is really productive. I think this is a good market discipline in signaling policy maker as well as player that you are not going to enjoy a cheap money anymore, unlimited liquidity, but then you have to be very prudent. Uh, from the uh, economy point of view, meaning that you have to make sure that you have flexibility, and that's why movement of the exchange rate at uh, some degree that is reflecting this adjustment is fine. It should not be seen that, oh, you are becoming weakening, or you are becoming weak, and you are going to be vulnerable. This is part of the adjustment. As long as the adjustment is smooth enough so that all the company or player can adjust to this new level of price, then it should be fine. This is part of what you call it flexibility that create more resilience. Rather than if you are fixed exchange rate, just like 97, 98, exactly. then it's going to be very difficult for a country to be adapting to this kind of situation. So I think at the end, the country will respond, absorbing some of this chain, adjusting, but at the same time strengthening what is the fundamental uh, for your economy. You wanted to add? Governor? Yes, I'd like to add um, two issues related to coordination between monetary policies and fiscal policies. One of the source of global volatility now today is the fact that the U.S. monetary policies and fiscal policies might, you know, might, uh, could have been much uh, better coordinated. As we know, the Fed has prepared the market so well during the past few years with forward guidance, with dot plot, and when the Fed increased the rate, there was no effect on the market. But what has been added on top is the fiscal policies of the current U.S. administrations uh, that will put pre more pressures on the wage, will put more pressure on inflation, and I'm afraid also on trade deficits of the U.S., and that's a new supply to the market. It might affect the pace of normalizations that the Fed might have to, might have to pursue. The other uh, aspect of um, coordination between you know, the government and central bank is related to policies on financial stability. When you talk about macro prudential policies, you know, some of the policies measures are beyond the mandate of the central bank alone. Sometimes you have to deal with shadow banking. Sometimes you have to put a brake on you know, like real estate um, development. And this requires a lot of coordination between the government and central bank. So we have to look at, um, you know, a broad menu set and, and how we can improve coordinations in a time like this. Uh, Judy, Nazar, your perspective from, from businesses. Um, as I said, you know, um, we are operating in, 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 in Asia. We've operated here for a long time. Clearly, there are concerns in terms of the near term volatilities, and especially if you think about what. Uh, the escalation of potential trade tensions, which uh, has, have turned out to be quite unpredictable. And that, that's the biggest topic on most of our clients' mind. What does that mean uh, for uh, the whole um, you know, US-China trade route? Uh, what does that mean for whole supply chain configuration? Do I have to rethink my whole uh, business models? That, that's what's been actually on most of our clients' mind. Um, and I think through this whole U.S.-China uh, trade tension, there will be winners and there will be losers. 
And actually, you know, when we speak to many of our clients in Vietnam and some of our clients in, in Malaysia, they, they actually see this as a potential opportunity where some of the protect, uh, production facilities will then be moved to the, these countries and, and they will enjoy some of that benefit. So I think uh, from a business perspective, yes, uh, more cautious, yes, more volatility, but given that, uh, you know, ultimately this region is still uh, growing uh, and very positive and there are you know, um, opportunities for many of these companies to shift on these uh, supply chain manufacturing capabilities, uh, we think uh, we remain, like I said, very positive in the medium long term. Nazar, has the emerging market route impacting cross-border uh, banking activities given your exposure in some of these markets, including Indonesia? I mean, I think in terms of what's happening today, clearly, markets are much more um, discerning um, and the focus has been on countries, um, businesses with high US dollar uh, exposure. Yeah. Um, and so therefore, as a business, uh, we also have to focus our attention on those uh, markets. I mean, clearly, you know, in situations for a bank, when you borrow, uh, you've got your asset in US dollar, you've got a liability in US dollar, but your asset could actually be an NPL in which case it's not much of an asset. Um, so these are the kind of issues uh, we have to uh, focus on. But I think that um, this is clearly a challenge of regional banking. Um, I fear that you're alluding to this question of whether this kind of um, um, situation questions the whole basis of regional banking in terms of transmission of crisis from one country to another. Um, I don't agree. Uh, I think the issue is uh, risk management, and I think the issue is regulatory oversight. Uh, if countries uh, get those right, if ASEAN gets those right, I think cross-border banking is actually very positive uh, to regional integration. Let's touch on the impact of the impending full-blown trade war. I mean, we've talked about how we will not see the fallout this year. Growth is intact, but we could see that next year. Kevin, your thoughts on how Asia, ASEAN could be impacted? Well, again, it will be very different depending on where you are in the region. We've got countries that are very much driven by manufacturing export. We're sitting in one right now. Of course, you start to ask what markets will it then seek to export to? And I think that is going to be the discussion. But I think even on the notion of a full-blown trade war, let's just pause and understand what's going on at the moment. You heard this morning the Regional Comprehensive Economic Pact, the RCEP. We've got the CPT, uh, TPP just been announced. So, this generalization, I think it's an example of don't let the facts get in the way of a good headline. The headline is trade war. The reality is there are a lot of markets out there. And one of the challenges and opportunities ASEAN is intra-ASEAN trade today is still relatively modest. So these markets need to be, so new markets need to be found to replace those that are curbed. But I don't believe in the longer run that we're actually going to see a reduction, a sudden reduction in overall demand. We might see it shift. We might see patterns change between different economies, but the facts are the facts. There is still an awful lot of growth left in this part of the world for the economies in this part of the world. And you can spend a lot of time worrying about what might happen in further areas, further field. Getting off to that opportunity leaves plenty of runway. So I don't think we should be complacent. I don't think we should ignore it, but let's be mindful of the facts. And I think the headlines at the moment get caught in the China-US trade battle. There's a lot of other markets where this part of the world is trading today. Softer commodity prices, Ibu Shimuliani. Well, first, I think uh, on this, uh, the scenario, whether there is a possibility of a full-blown trade war, this is the largest economy in the world, like it or not. In many of the ASEAN country economic model, the development, the progress, in reducing poverty in many of the ASEAN countries really depend on their export. So basically, this is going to be a serious consequence for the ASEAN because we always think that uh, investment and export is important. And in the past, it's always depend on the largest economy to become a destination of your market. So this is one thing that needs to be responded. But I agree with Kevin that within ASEAN, intra-trade, ASEAN or ASEAN, this is big enough economy. So we can create a social safety net within ourselves if we really want to work together as a group, as mentioned earlier, ASEAN is 636 million. Uh, we have a growing middle class. Uh, we always have a very prudent, sound macro policy within this region. This is relatively safe uh, and, and, and secure uh, region. 
so this is going to be one of the opportunity for us not to rely outside or we should have a contingent plan then if outside Asia have a problem we should be able to strengthen our cooperation for each country it's going to be too small but if it is as a group I think that's have a chance uh, the economic model of really creating shared prosperity and cooperation need to be defended by us rule-based policy which is going to be very important because you can really hear from the uh, market player corporation they are more busy now actually try to understand what's going to happen rather than thinking about what should I do with my comparative advantage and try to scale up uh, their competitiveness. They are now looking at all those uncertainty and that make all the decision regarding investment is going to be scaled down or weight. And this kind of weighting game is going to be the one that uh, need to be carefully managed by all of us. Of course, I mean, everybody's looking for intra-ASEAN trade to be expedited to, to grow. But the thing is, when you take a look at the numbers, it's, it's been very, very slow. We're looking at less than 20% of intra-ASEAN trade. Um, and we're having trouble increasing that. What is, what is hindering us, Nazir? No, I think intra-ASEAN trade has been frustrating, hanging around at between 22 to 24%. Um, but having said that, if you look at the growth uh, of intra-ASEAN FDI has been tremendous. From year 2000, it was 4%, now it's 19.4%. That's a huge success uh, because of ASEAN. So overall, I think ASEAN has been a huge success. Can we do more trade together? Yes, so we need to then deep dive into what's holding it back. Uh, and here, I think there's some real nitty gritty issues that we need to solve. Uh, if you look at the e-commerce, I have a client called Fashion Valley, and they tell me that it's easier for them to export, uh, faster for them to export to the UK than to Jakarta. I and mean, this is basic fashion goods, <laughs> right? So there clearly is, and then despite this morning, we heard about ASEAN single window. Well, it ain't working well. <laughs> uh, so these are the nitty gritty that ASEAN governments need to look into to facilitate um, uh, and enable more trade. So if regulation is too slow, if the governments are not keeping up with the pace, just ignore them, go ahead, businesses well, should leave. If, if you look at tariffs, right, we sing about 98.5% uh, of tariffs redu reduced, but non-tariff barriers have shot through the roof in compensation for that. Right? So ASEAN's got to get real uh, that, you know, as maybe this trade war is the best thing to happen to ASEAN. It's going to force us to come together and do more business together. Kevin? I would echo that, and remember there's two things going to force ASEAN to come together. The other is technology. The markets in which we're now competing in this part of the world require some scale. And that scale will not be satisfied by the smaller ASEAN economies. It's going to be only satisfied if ASEAN really can unlock the 650 million people that live in this part of the world. So I would echo what Nazir says. The non-tariff issue is now acute, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, we are being a little hard. If the 22-24 is still better than it was, the real issue is, what's it going to take to say, in a world where technology is dismantling borders, whether we like it or not, in a world where the easy option is no longer just to send something to another part of the world, it's actually China South, we have a very different set of trading in relationships. In that world, there's a call to action here, and that call to action creates enormous opportunity. If it's ignored, then I think all the worries are realistic. If it's heated, I think actually there's an awful lot of runway still left in here. But managing the economy in this case, as Linda, I mean, I can understand when you are dealing with the economy, you really have to make sure that they are continue balance or relatively balanced. If it is not, then you are going to be corrected. Either you are corrected by crisis, by market, or others in this case. So within the context of this ASEAN, Indonesia is the largest economy in ASEAN, definitely have to do more and a lot. Uh, President Jokowi has tried to remove all the obstacles for the investment, establishing one single uh, submission for the investment to be easier for them to come. Uh, we are also uh, become one of the top reformer because of ease of doing business based on the World Bank Index. We are improving. But as a big country, Indonesia need to do more. And if, when the situation changed very rapidly, like what happened in the 2018, in fact, the current account deficit was driven, among others, is the consumption import 
is increased yeah. very dramatically. And this is coming from the digital also. 50% increase in July, 34% increase in August. And so that create, if you can continue having a capital inflow to compensate current account deficit, it's fun. But when this uh, capital flow is become skittish and it's becoming very uh, full with anxiety because of the potential contagion, then you really have a problem with this current account deficit. You can see and compare, happen to be you sit me next to Thailand. The <laughs> Thailand got an account surplus, and that's why their currency is barely moved in this case. So this is just to show that as a policymaker, you really have to make sure which one, the variable or indicator can move faster, which is actually beyond policymaker ability to catch up. And then how you are going to make sure that the correction is not going to create the economy suffer more, but instead correction that will make the economy stronger. This is one of the policy choices that need to be made. For Indonesian case, meaning that, oh, okay, while well, we have to address the issue with this temporary or short-term imbalances, we have to keep steady in saying and believing that openness is good, strengthening your fundamental need to be done more and faster, and you have to be able to balance this with the risk which is now happening regionally and globally. But even, let me just follow up. I mean, like in the case of Indonesia, it's imposed, well, it's considering imposing tax on imports. That would impact consumption growth, which would impact growth as a whole. Would you consider increasing the price of oil, for instance? And in the long term, what would you do to increase FDI? Because that's a way to address your current account issue. The FDI is definitely, because what is happening in 2016 and 17, when we also have the current account deficit at the amount of 17 billion, we can attract capital at the amount of 29 billion. So it's fine, reserve even increase, whether this is in the form of FDI or portfolio or short term flow. But we have capital surplus, we have current account deficit, but the surplus is larger. 2018, when the situation on FDI is becoming a bit slow because of this interest rate increase, anxiety, uncertainty at the global level, as well as the portfolio, then you have a problem. Even when you have a current account deficit the same level, but you cannot finance it, then you have a problem. So what is the policy option? I think what is need to be done at the short run is try to make sure that this deficit is not going to widen because the current, the capital account, you cannot do it immediately and suddenly you are going to have a capital flow because what you see is capital outflow going to their country that is in the United States. So within that context, then you need to correct very uh, quickly. But even within that context of policy response, you have to be also very careful because you don't want to weakening your own growth potential. So this is not the first best option policy. You find the second best or maybe third best, but still do. It's combination between protection, but try to, to maintain the momentum. You reduce def deficit so your vulnerability is going to be less under these current circumstances. Now, in terms of the oil price, the oil price according to the fiscal assumption is almost the same. So you actually, question yourself what kind of stand that you really need in terms of addressing the issue of volatility at this moment. Definitely, price can discipline you in a way that with the signaling of the price, rupiah is becoming cheaper. Basically, many of the exporters in Indonesia should actually enjoy because this is going to be their earned revenue more. And this is going to be boosting the, the, the gross potential for Indonesia. While import, with the dollar becoming more expensive, rupiah cheaper, is going to be much more expensive. So this is a classic, what you call it, expenditure shifting and expenditure reducing when you are facing with this kind of uh, 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 depreciation of your currency or volatility of your currency. Now, on a, on a fiscal policy, I think Indonesia has already made a fiscal consolidation in the past three years. We are moving from 2.5 into 2.2 or even now below 2% for the next year. This is just to show a consistent, credible trend of fiscal prudence when we see that the escalation of risk is there. When the cost of borrowing is increased, you're becoming more and more careful in designing your, design, your policy, especially on the fiscal side. 
then you are going to ask the real sector, that's why the structural policy need to be accelerated because you are not going to depend on fiscal to become the engine of growth. They need to be careful, but then you need to be more ambitious in doing your reform on a real sector. And that's why President is doing the investment policy reform, single submission, uh, regulation uh, has right. been reduced, cost of doing business has been reduced. That kind of the strategy that you really know which instrument fit at what situation. And this is exactly what we're trying to do now. Governor, you wanted to... Yes, just going back to your last questions on you know, looking at trade in ASEAN, and you seem to suggest that um, you don't see much progress so far. But I would like to echo what Nasser has mentioned. What is more important than intra-regional trade is economic integration in the broader sense. You know, investment um, by ASEAN companies into ASEAN countries have picked up substantially and creating regional supply chain. The Japanese created regional supply chain for us two decades ago, but now we see a lot of ASEAN companies doing that as well. And now with the concerns on trade issues, global trade issues, we started to see Chinese companies looking at ASEAN as an alternative um, production hubs. I mean, they should not put everything only in the Chinese basket now with the current uh, protectionism atmosphere. And that will, that will continue to strengthen competitive, competitiveness and competitive advantage of ASEAN as a region. Now, what is lacking behind in terms of promoting economic integration in ASEAN, in my view, is financial connectivity. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can work together to improve financial connectivity, and the central banks in ASEAN are also looking at different mechanisms to do that. We just concluded that um, negotiation on qualified ASEAN banks with Bank Nekala Malaysia is in the process of being ratified by the respective parliaments. You know, we're looking at where to link up a faster pay system between Singapore and Thailand, and that should bring down the cost of money transfer between the two countries substantially. We're also working with um, central banks of neighboring countries, try to see whether we can use common standard, for example, the QR code for payment standard. If we can use a common standard that will help bring down the cost of money transfers and also to help accommodate the growth of e-commerce in the region. So there are a lot of things that we can also do on financial connectivity promotion with a view to enhancing economic integration. And that's something that ASEAN needs. Now, one of the, one of the reasons why the EM route is happening is the strong dollar. What assumptions are you making for where the Green Bank is headed? <laughs> We're building our assumption based, in, based on three in two interest rate increases, right? Three 75 basis points over two years and two in three years. That means it will come down uh, 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 after that. So um, the danger, of course, is, is that assumption changes uh, then you're really talking about further weakening. Judy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our research is uh, similar. You know, we are um, uh, pricing in a couple of uh, rate hikes this year and a couple of rate hikes next year. And frankly, we think a lot of that has already been priced into the U.S. dollar uh, for now. And we actually think the dollar is pretty neutral at this point. Uh, against most of the currencies. Of course, you know, there are other factors we have to continue to watch. Uh, and uh, for now, we, we think it's actually pretty neutral. Is it fair to assume that we will get a weaker dollar given the expectation of a, a convergence of interest rates sooner rather than later? Well, it's not the level that I would like to comment. But I think the volatility um, is more important and we continue to see a lot more volatility. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve has done quite nicely in terms of preparing the market, but there are a lot of uncontrollable factors outside the mandate of the Federal Reserves. And on top of that, you also have two other systemically important central banks that have not started normalization process yet. Whenever they're given indications of normalization, that we also create a lot of volatility in the exchange rate of major currencies. Kevin? I'm not in the dollar forecasting game. I will leave it to these people. <laughs> no, how, how do you think the strong dollar is impacting businesses? Well, look, I think obviously it depends on how their, how their balance of trade looks. And so there's no question that for our clients, they're very concerned about making sure they've got appropriate hedging in place, that they are hedged naturally in terms of where they're sourcing from and where they're selling. And that's one of the reasons why I don't accept that it's okay that ASEAN talks about the financial integration without the trading integration. It does matter what end markets you're selling into. It really does matter. And I think at the end of the day, 
for our clients, they're looking at the mix of the geographies they're selling. And for those that have got the US as their number one market, of course, it has a bigger difference than if they don't. But I think at this point in time, our clients are far more focused on the fundamentals of their operations, their supply chains. And in a way, they're almost now accepting the volatility that they have just got to live with is not going to disappear. We are in a different era when it comes to the way in which people are managing their businesses. And I think the day when people could assume that they have global supply chains beautifully, seamlessly joined up, we all now know that's not coming back. And so there is the need to have local supply chains that are a bit more insulated from some of the fluctuations and where you can control the supply more normally. And I think that is the reality most people are now beginning to get their heads around. Actually, um, sorry, mo most of our clients are not just looking at dollar against Absolutely. their home currency. They're looking at their home currency against the Chinese yuan. Uh, and because the trade with China is probably, you know, outweighs uh, uh, their, their dependence on U.S. dollar. And uh, from that perspective, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a basket of currencies that they're measuring their currency against. So I, I do think dollar is important. It's still the global currency. But I think over the years, that reliance on dollar, dollar borrowing has come off. And uh, I think it's a little bit over, you know, emphasized. <laughs> just talking to our clients. Yeah. No, sir? no, I just feel that as we reflect on the current period, we need to relook at this dependency on the US dollar. Uh, and, we've, and also, of course, the exorbitant privilege that comes with our dependency on the US dollar. Uh, because what's happening today is, of course, you have a US government that's pumping the economy in good times, uh, very pro-cyclical. Uh, and you could even have a situation where they ramp up the trade wars and no change in interest rates, but you get a, a, a flight to safety, in which case monies get out of emerging markets back to the US, and we all struggle. Right? So this whole system today of being overly dependent on the US yeah. dollar um, needs to be re-looked at. Uh, over Unlikely the to term. change anytime soon, though. No, but you've got to start somewhere, and you've got to think of alternatives. Ibu, for a country that's so susceptible to dollar movements, your thoughts on where it's headed, and if you take a look at the threat of the strong dollar versus the threat of Turkey, which one is greater for Indonesia? Well, I think the word susceptible <clears throat> need to be put within the perspective of what is the indicator of susceptible in this case. For Indonesia, as I said, the current account deficit, you have the foreign debt, is actually Indonesia is much lower if you compare with, of course, Argentina, Turkey, but also if you compare within the context of historical of Indonesia, many of the foreign borrowing has been hedged in this case. So we learned quite a lot from what uh, we experienced back in 97, 2008, 2013, and now. Uh, corporate uh, level debt in Indonesia is considered very low. Household debt is also very low. Government debt uh, below 30%. So basically, if you look at the funda uh, fundamentals, the indicator is not saying that you are a reckless and that's why you are susceptible. It is not. The psychology, uh, people can say that Indonesia need to deepen the financial sector, mm -hmm. which I fully agree on that. And that is with, uh, within the context of the program, we try to deepen our financial and bonds market in Indonesia. And this is all uh, the work that need to be done in a more medium long term. Well, of course, some of the psychology and historical is sometimes still hoovering and uh, creating more on the reaction or response, which is not really based on the fundamental. Another thing in this case for Indonesia is uh, when we are talking about adjustment policy for the country, basically we look at all the five pillar, four pillars of Indonesia. The government account, that is fiscal policy, I think we are okay, although some of the debt is actually owed from foreigners. And this is something maybe we are much higher than India, for example. So we need to lower, and this is linked to the deepening bond market in Indonesia. The second one, we are talking about monetary policy. This is the fourth year in a row Indonesia has an inflation at around 3%, which is for Indonesia historical, because before that, we have an inflation close to 8%. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have more credibility on the monetary policy in making the rupiah stable in terms of the inflation. If you talk about uh, the banking system, 
uh, the non-performing loan because of the commodity price shock uh, down after 2014 has already been cleaned up. So today is actually in a much more cleaner and stronger balance sheet of the banking system. So we have a problem on this current account, and this is not like 5% deficit on the current account, 3%, which is even not close to when we were in a uh, taper tantrum, or in this case, during the 97, 98. So in a way, I think uh, we try to communicate, and I think uh, this kind of word of susceptible uh, not being used more frequently to then put it within the context of Indonesia, because it creates psychology rather than the real fundamental for Indonesia. And, and that's the point. It's worth reminding ourselves, because I think part of what's happening is we're conflating what's going on outside with what's happening in ASEAN. External debt relative to GDP, it's in the 30s. Uh, government debt, it's in the high 30s. The G7, 100 and something. Right. Forget the rest of Argentina and Latin America. Yeah. So there is a real risk of having a conversation which isn't anchored in the facts on the ground here in ASEAN. And I think it is important we don't allow the psychology mm -hmm. to creep into the reality. And the reality is a bit different in this part of the world than it is in some of the other geographies where we should have a different conversation around very high debt levels, high dollar denominated borrowings, and frankly challenging export markets. That isn't the recipe in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to bring up the point that Nasser brought up about weaning ourselves away from the US dollar. How do you see the process playing out? Well, um, I think it has to be done at different levels, and this is a long journey. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not. Um, is there a time frame you can put when no, it's a long so. journey? Well, you, <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, it requires a trust. I think this is the most important thing. You know, if you look at alternatives, you know, people need to have trust in the alternative. And, um, and, but you can start from small steps. I could tell you So one, if not the US dollar, it would be? It could be a com diversification, combinations of currencies, you know, a basket. Um, a basket. Um, even for ASEAN, um, we started with uh, Bank Negala Malaysia and Bank Indonesia to promote the use of local currencies for trade and investment within ASEAN. If you look at the exchange rate between Indonesian rupiah and Thai baht, it used to be, have very large spread and no one was using it. The way they calculated the exchange rate is always cross rate with the US dollar or Singapore dollar. So we started with some schemes with Bank Indonesia, Bank Dekala Malaysia to promote the use of local currencies. And we have seen declining in spread, but it takes some time you know, to, for the market to adjust, for the business people to adjust. Also the same with uh, Chinese Remembi. We started having this program with them for quite some time now, um, uh, starting with only the use of Thai baht and Remembi to have a direct quotation only in Yunnan province to facilitate cross-border trade and investment activities. Now it's expanded to the whole of China. And unsurprisingly, when we look at um, the way to promote regional currencies, there was no direct quotation between Thai baht and Japanese yen until March of this year. And, and that's, that's a big, 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 big gap, given the fact that the Japanese investors and Japanese trades have played a lot of roles in the Thai economy. So when we saw that, we started having um, arrangement to promote direct quotation. But if it takes some time, it's, it's, it's a journey. Before I get to the fourth industrial revolution, I just want to talk about the rise and the slowdown of China. What your thoughts are the impact would be? Kevin. Well, uh, that, you know, there lies the big question. What is the slowdown in China? You know, we heard this morning 6.7 to 7 percent, I think, was the number that was given. That ain't a slowdown. But on the other hand, there are some indicators. The PMI numbers looked a little bit softer. There's some other numbers that are beginning to, to look a bit softer. And clearly, that will have a significant impact because simply the amount of demand China is sucking up for commodities, intermediate manufacturing. But here's the but. It's a very difficult picture to then disassemble because we talked about Vietnam. Will they export some of these jobs to Vietnam? Will that be the response? So I think it's very dangerous to just make a generalization. China slow down, therefore the world catches pneumonia. The reality is it's going to be slow. It's a slow slowdown of an enormous base, so the absolute still remains. This huge. is the largest trading partner for a lot of the countries. I, absolutely, it is, but it's still growing at six. Let's say it grows at 600 basis points. Think of what that means in terms of incremental demand every year. Something like half a Germany. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't get. I think we need to keep this in perspective. The slowdown is that. It's a slowdown. It's not a stop. And as long as it stays in that position, there's still plenty of growth and supply happening in the rest of the world because of the absolute numbers that we're talking about. The Chinese economy is just so large. But I wouldn't gloss over it. It is something everybody's going to have to keep a, a very weird, careful eye on. 
Nazar, when China sneezes, we'll catch a cold. okay? We'll catch a bit of a cold. <laughs> Not pneumonia. <laughs> Not pneumonia. And don't infect, don't try and work, work ourselves out of it together. And, and, and they seem to have good doctors. I, mean, I think the authority is there. I mean, they, they know what they're doing. They conducted the reform initiatives well you know, before. Um, I think they, 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 have cap they, they have capabilities and they also have resources. But the good side uh, from the speech this morning that the China uh, respond to the current environment, that they repeatedly mentioned about that we need to uh, maintain the rule base. I think that's really a good signal. And I mean, in the way, in the past, the China was the one who want to be invited to come to the rule base. And now they're the one who championing or even saying that we need to have this kind of rule based system to be defended by all of us. I think it's more like a sense of the global economy require a certain uh, certainty in terms of this is not going to be a smooth journey, but in that journey, if there is something happen, whether there is an accident, there is a tension, we should have a certain platform to discuss and to settle that. It's not using uh, a power in order for you to impose whatever that you dictate as right or wrong in this case. And this is maybe the most important uh, the essence of all this, this kind of environment that we are all need as a country to also raising our voice and try to also contribute in making sure that the world is going to be in an order. It's not going to be always peaceful, linear uh, progress, but there is an order that will depend on for all of us to, to depend it, to, to defend it, so that it can become a dispute resolution which is uh, credible enough and fair. Is it fair to say that in this Trump era, neighbors like China, Japan are learning to work with each other better? Well, they don't have any other choice, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, that is exactly the beauty of it. I mean, uh, that uh, you suddenly see that, okay, uh, the country that used to be for all of us to look up and then to depend, now I think they are busy with themselves. Why don't we now become an adult in the room and we can discuss among ourselves? I mean, without that kind of extreme condition, policymaker, economic player, they become lazy to adjust. I mean, with this kind of situation, it's just saying that you, the world is just too big and too important to depend on only one country. And too connected. Yeah. I mean, therein lies the challenge. We talk about trade wars, but at the same time, to your point, we've never been more connected, whether it's data flows or consumer economies that want to suck in products because they like the brands from overseas. And so that's the reality that we're dealing with. And I think, therefore, the option of actually Japan and China not working together, you know, those, have, those days have moved on. And it is why I think neighbors are talking to each other and why, and we should talk probably about the fourth industrial revolution at some point, that force, that provides another reason why we are going to see more data flowing between countries and actually more connections. So the trade war is one thing, but the connectivity that's happening across the world, that's increasing massively. And that will not stop. The data flows are not going to stop. Let's pick up yeah. on the fourth industrial revolution, the opportunities and how that would, that would be created in ASEAN, in Asia, Judy. Yeah, it's it's uh, coming to Vietnam. It's you know t talking to our colleagues. It's just amazing the exponential growth in the internet uh, economy here, right? Um, you have, as I mentioned early, eighty percent of the population here have a smartphone. Uh, th that makes access to education, healthcare, uh, financial services at people's fingertip at a very affordable cost. These are just tremendous opportunities uh, for, uh, for this region. Uh, it's estimated that the internet uh, uh, economy is going to be $200 billion in 2025, from something like $10 billion last year. So I, I think, again, coming back to the fundamentals of you know, this whole region and the adoption and the innovation that, that we're seeing in this, re in this region is far uh, uh, away from the risks that, that you know, US-China trade war, some of these currency fluctuations, we maintain that we look at these fundamentals, the infrastructure bill, we talk a little bit about the rise of the middle class. Uh, I think these are uh, very important trends that we continue to focus on, including this whole you know, um, uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution, something we are 
very positive about. Also the loss of jobs and disruption, which is not great for some economies which are experiencing perhaps even a growing population, Nazir. Well, I think the fourth industrial revolution is hugely exciting, will bring a lot of benefits, um, but also side effects, uh, and also disruptive challenges to incumbents and, and, and potential job losses, etc. So it is imperative that we understand it. It's imperative that we you know, think about the right policy responses. Uh, and this is our push uh, at WEF. Um, to make sure that ASEAN looks at the 4.0 challenge collectively um, because what's going to drive the 4.0 uh, and our ability to um, um, capitalize on it is our ability to move data across countries, move talent across countries, move capital across countries. Uh, these are essential uh, and at the moment we're not doing a great job. And as Kevin mentioned just now, economies of scale is even more important. Today if you look at banking, right? Our fear is not so much the big banks, our fear is the big platform companies. And you look at the kind of scale that Ali and Tencent has managed to develop in one Chinese economy, yeah, and the threat that brings to financial services in Southeast Asia. Right? So we need uh, to avail our own companies, uh, the scale of uh, ASEAN, uh, so that we can capitalize on what's there in the fourth industrial revolution. The challenge for Indonesia would be ensuring that it is inclusive. Oh, definitely in this case. First on this industrial 4.0, President is already mentioned in many occasions. And I think that's create an excitement, not especially Indonesia have a young demographic. If you make a survey, especially among the youth, they are more optimistic. They are seeing more opportunity rather than threat. They definitely change in terms of their idea of what is going to be their future career, what kind of job that they are going to have. So it's more on an option rather than maybe for the baby boomer seeing this as a threat uh, because they are maybe also have a technological gap, understanding, adjustment. So for Indonesia to be inclusive, uh, we definitely still have a gap. When, when you talk about financial inclusion or the inclusivity on the financial side, the financial inclusion in Indonesia is among the lowest in the ASEAN country. Uh, and that's why penetration of these financial services to the poor especially is going to be very important. That's why government social safety net program giving cash transfer for the low income household is now uh, being done not through cash but through this uh, bank account. We also have, uh, an, uh, of course, an issue of this uh, inclusiveness in terms of the unevenness of the education. If you talk about Jakarta, which is actually creating and breeding a lot of your, you call it startup, we have Unicorn, they look at Gojek, everybody look at Nadim as a role model now. So, I mean, that's not a problem in the big city. But Indonesia is not only Jakarta, it's not Java. We have all other islands which I think the quality of education need to be also improved. Not to mention, of course, what kind of education. We spend equally 20% of our budget on education, just like Vietnam. The results are different. Vietnam is really focused on this math, and I think they are really compatible well. In the PISA score, they are actually scored much higher than Indonesia. So the challenge for Indonesia when you talk about Industrial 4.0 we actually see this as an opportunity, but this opportunity of creating and correcting in terms of equality or to become more inclusive can only be done when the government investing in infrastructure so that connectivity and those people who live in what we call it remote area, by definition, by definition when you have all the infrastructure being built, there is none, none in the Indonesian geography should be called as a remote. This is just east, west, not south. But it doesn't mean that you are remote. And then also in terms of quality of skill and education. Uh, uh, that is something that we prepare now. But of course, at the same time, today, when all the company coming to Indonesia, you have uh, Gojek, and then we have Uber, we have Grab. They are all competing with the conventional transportation uh, company in Indonesia, they need to adjust. And the, this, what you call it, job disruption or business model disruption is something which is already being recognized now widely in Indonesia. I think if you talk with many of Indonesia business uh, community, they've already seen this 
as coming and they need to adjust. The question, how fast they are going to adjust. And for, for, for policy maker, for us, the discussion about this industrial 4.0 definitely require us to adjust in terms of tax policy, in terms of equal opportunity, in terms of people should have a good infrastructure and education, and in terms of the competition policy, not to mention data and data privacy. I think that is also another which is totally new for many of us. Governor, the job of the governor is to worry. What's the biggest worry when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution for you? <laughs> no, the, industrial, uh, the fourth industrial revolution presents a lot of opportunities and the social challenges. I totally agree with uh, what uh, Minister Simuliani has just said. Um, you know, Thailand being an um, old demographic structure, um, perhaps we becoming the aging society fastest in Southeast Asia, we still see this 4.0 uh, industrial revolution, very exciting. I think there are three uh, key words that public policies need to focus on to help you know, uh, benefit, leap benefits from 4.0 industrial revolution. One is on productivity. It's very clear that the digital age will bring huge improvement in productivity, and, and that, 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 that is what we need, because you know, in becoming an aging society, all the workers have to be much more productive and they can benefit from technology advancements to be more productive. The second word, um, which is perhaps um, more challenging, is on inclusivity. Um, we need to make sure that whatever we, 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 you know, we what, whatever is getting developed, um, it's, it's inclusive, that people at large can benefit from it. I'll, I'll give you an, 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 an example. Um, we at the Bank of Thailand, we work with the Ministry of Finance, and we have put a lot of efforts in promoting electronic payments in Thailand, putting in you know, open infrastructure, faster pay systems, um, you know, common standards on electronic payment, and making it an open platform so that anyone can benefit from it. And that resulted in uh, all the banks eradicating, uh, eliminating all the electronic fund transfer fees early this year. And that's reduced the cost of electronic fund transfer very, you know, to basically zero. Uh, what, is, what is more exciting um, now when transactions are moving towards electronic payments, uh, SMEs that have complained all along about access to finance because the business model has always been collateral-based lending. But now with a good database on payment um, data, we can move from collateral-based lending to information-based lending, mm -hmm. and that should improve access to SME finance. This is just only an, a few examples that, um, of, of, the, of the initiatives that we have put in place to, to promote inclusiveness. The government has also, in the process of rolling out uh, high-speed internet access to all villages throughout Thailand, um, that will change the way people get you know, education, people get healthcare services. So inclusivity has to be, has to be an important aspect of digital policies. And the last one, um, which is equally important, is immunity or resilience. How do we take care of people who might be adversely affected or might have to go through unintended consequences, you know, the change in business model, change in the nature of the job? And the other thing that is very important is the cyber threat, cyber security. And that, that, that's, that's another pillar that you know, central banks and government agencies have to step up our efforts in preparations for the 4.0 industrial revolution. Now, before we wrap it up, I just want to go down the line. Uh, final thoughts as we think about the outlook for Asia going forward. We start with Kevin. I remain very positive about the outlook for Asia. I've been through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of volatility, and Asia's come out ahead. Why? Because I think at the end of the day, the digital productivity revolution that's going to take place as part of this revolution hinges on access and scale. Asia has both. ASEAN can choose to have scale. It can either opt in or opt out, but you need both. And I believe ASEAN could play a part in that, but Asia as a whole has both of those in plenty. Secondly, it's about a redeployed labor force, a labor force that's able to cope with automation that is more inclusive, brings women into the workforce. That is the second part of the formula, which offsets the demographic decline, which is already happening in China, but which actually will happen in large parts of ASEAN too. So provided ASEAN can make the most of reallocating labor, then again, I think it's well-placed to do that. And the third thing, which is perhaps the biggest and most obvious challenge, is we talk about access. Well, internet speeds today vary from 22 and a half megabits per second to four across ASEAN. That variability is a real obstacle to doing what we're talking about doing. So the infrastructure build-out and the investment needs to happen. 
Those three things, I think if those get done, I remain extremely optimistic about Asia. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. I think uh, this part of the world still has fundamentals on its side. Judy, glass half full. No, I mean, I, I think it's quite obvious that uh, we remain very positive. I just thought I'd share a, a very simple but very powerful client story. Uh, it's not in ASEAN, it's in Bangladesh. I was recently there in Bangladesh, and I met a client, and uh, he said, you know, my business is going through the roof. And I said, what kind of business are you in? He said, well, I used to be a poultry farmer, and now I've been selling ice cream. And I'm like, ice cream, how can that be exponential? He said, you know what? 10 years ago, five years ago, there were no refrigerators. Now, with a lot of our people owning refrigerators, this is the power of the middle class. I can now sell ice cream. And that in itself, I think, is GDP growth at its simplest form, and something we have to keep focus on, the opportunity of the rising middle class and what does that mean for this part of the world. Nazir. I think despite all attempts to stop it, this is definitely um, going to be the Chinese century. I hope it is also the Asian century uh, and what we need is within Asia to collaborate, to collaborate and to collaborate. Ibu? I'm very optimistic. By design, uh, as a policy maker, you have to really be more optimistic in order to create also an environment for your economy to be optimistic. With the policy which is focusing on human capital, improvement on the human capital, whether this is on education, health, social safety net, with the policy in, in which the Indonesia try to uh, build uh, the infrastructure so that we can fill the gap with the right policy at the macro level and be very pragmatic. I think the leadership of President Jokowi in trying to cope with the change, whether this is coming from commodity, which is coming from dollar, which is this is coming from trade policy, geopolitical, it's always have a good track record of flexibility and pragmatism. Uh, with that, I think the hope is really for the millennial, uh, the youth, the young generation, which is I think they are much, much more optimistic, they have less historical baggage, and they see future really a lot of alternative. And this young generation, more confidence, more educated, have more income, I think they are going to see ASEAN as a family, they are going to see the world as a place for them to interact. This is really a good future. Governor. Well, a lot of exciting opportunities ahead of us. But you know, the risk is also increasing in a global environment, so we can't be complacent. We have to uh, utilize whatever buffers we have wisely uh, to be able to, 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 to stay resilient. Um, and, and lastly, I totally agree with Nasser, enhancing collaborations among ASEAN countries and Asia, country, Asia countries um, in, in, in a larger context is, is, is very needed. And I think this is the right time for us to enhance collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration. Collaboration, growth, but don't be complacent. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you so much for your insights. <laughs>